Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. India is gripped by election fever, rallies, charges, controversies and so many sound bites. Amid all of this, India's brightest young minds are facing an existential question. Is their degree worth it? I'm talking about the IITs, the best engineering colleges in India. Their graduates are struggling with placements. Back in the day, an IIT admission or an MBA degree was the biggest prize. So what has happened now? That's what we'll discuss tonight. In Taiwan, a massive earthquake hit today, followed by multiple aftershocks. The pictures are spooky. In the Ukraine war, NATO is hoping to Trump-proof them with a $100 billion fund. But the same countries are also funding Russia. How does it work? In Pakistan, the judges are appealing for help. They say the ISI is harassing and threatening them. In Turkey, a massive protest against President Erdogan's latest move. In the Netherlands, a debate over euthanasia for mental health. Also, why is Botswana threatening to send 20,000 elephants to Germany? Why don't women invest their money? What is stopping them? What is lunar standard time? Why do we need it? And what is speech fasting? All this and more coming up. The headlines first. Will the United Nations issue an arms embargo on Israel? The UN Human Rights Council will consider a draft resolution on it. If the resolution proposed by Pakistan is adopted, it would be the first time that the United Nations body has taken a stand on the Gaza war. The European Union is probing two Chinese-owned solar panel firms over subsidies. This comes as trade tensions heat up between Brussels and Beijing. Since 2023, the EU has cracked down on threats to its industry from China and the United States, Beijing has warned the bloc that its actions risk a trade war. Imran Khan accuses the Pakistani army of poisoning his wife. The jail former Prime Minister claims his wife was poisoned at their home, which has been converted into a jail. Imran Khan says the Pakistani army chief will be responsible if anything untoward happens to his wife. Uganda's constitutional court rejects a petition against its anti-gay law. The law, which was adopted in May last year, is considered one of the toughest in the world. Punishments include life imprisonment and the death penalty. And Switzerland is set to vote on limiting immigration. The aim is to stop the population from reaching 10 million before 2050. In Switzerland, citizens can trigger votes by collecting 100,000 signatures within 18 months. Currently, foreigners make up a quarter of the population. The year was 2018. Elon Musk dropped a pearl on social media. He said engineering is the closest thing to magic. Many in India would agree. We've seen engineering create rags to riches stories, turn families in debt into millionaires, turn shy students into tech titans. So magic does sum it up. But the key to every bit of magic is secrecy. If the world knows your trick, you're no more in demand. Has engineering reached that stage? Have our modern degrees reached that state? Tonight we explore this question and there's a reason why. Most of us agree that IITs are among the top colleges worldwide, the Indian Institutes for Technology. The assumption is you crack the IIT and you're set for life. A big pay package awaits you. Perhaps not anymore. The news coming out of the IITs is worrying. In the Bombay campus, 36% students are yet to be placed. Some 2,000 students had registered for placement. More than 700 are yet to get a job. We're talking about the best engineering college in India, also among the best globally. Yet 36% of its students are yet to be placed, and it's not a one-off. Last year was more of the same. In 2023, around 33% students did not get jobs. We looked at other IITs too. In the Delhi campus, 40% students were not placed in 2023. In Kanpur, 31% are yet to be placed. What does this tell you? The obvious, that the job market is struggling and the data shows something peculiar. The more educated you are, the tougher it is to find a job. Let me show you some numbers. Graduate unemployment is almost 30%, 3-0. 
unemployment among people with higher education is 18%. And now look at unemployment among people who cannot read or write, just 3.4%. This is called educated unemployment. And just to be clear, this does not mean that you should drop out of school or that college degrees are useless. It only means that you need to be smart about your education. Just think about it. If an IIT cannot get you placed, what chance do other colleges have? So we need to ask an important question. What is your college degree worth? Let's look at engineering first. The average cost of a degree is around 8 lakh rupees, which is 9,500 US dollar, the average. And what is the average salary? Between 15 and 30,000 rupees per month, let's say around 200 dollars. And this depends on a lot of variables like how the national economy is doing, how good your college is, and how efficient you are as an individual. Another popular degree is the MBA. It's a two-year course that can cost more than 15 lakh rupees. That's around $18,000. And what do you get for that investment? Around $480 per month. And remember, the MBA is a postgraduate degree. So first you spend on graduation, then you spend on an MBA. Now let's compare these two degrees to another job, say that of a flight attendant. The average course fee is between 50,000 and 2 lakh rupees. Let's choose the upper limit. So the course costs 2 lakh rupees. And how much do you make? The average is around 40,000 rupees. 4-0, 40, 40,000. Now I know these degrees and jobs are very, very different. The lifestyle and skills are also different and the prospects later on are also different. But the point here is quite simple. From a monetary perspective, a flight attendance course today is more valuable. Which brings us back to MBAs and engineers. Are these degrees not worth it? Well, many companies think so. You see, a degree is like any other commodity. Higher the supply, lower the price. In this case, the price does not mean college fees. It means your salary. Again, let's look at MBAs. Every year, more than 230,000 MBAs enter the market. 2,30,000 every year. And that number will keep going up. Just consider the CAT, the common admission test. You can enroll at MBA colleges based on your CAT score. Last year, there was a 30% jump in candidates. Now, do you see the problem here? More and more MBAs are entering the market, but the demand simply isn't there. In fact, MBA job openings dropped 55% in January this year. So what should students do? Well, the advice is quite simple. Follow the market. Focus on employability, not on degrees. That seems to be the biggest problem at the moment. Companies want people with specific skill sets. In the past, they would hire such people, but now they prefer to build them. Listen to one industry expert, and I'm quoting, a graduate at 5 to 6 lakh trained for one year is probably more relevant and effective than an MBA at 12 lakh who still needs to go through unlearning. So broadly speaking, two things must be done. First, identify emerging skills. These are things in high demand, things that will give you an edge in the jobs market. I can give you some examples, like sustainability skills. Every company and country is going green, so huge opportunities will open up. Another example is machine learning. The World Economic Forum called it the fastest growing job. There's an AI model coming out every week, so the people making them will be in demand. Same for cybersecurity. As the world digitizes, we'll need more cyber guardians. So parents, teachers, and students need to identify such skills. They must work on it from school. That is the first step. The second step is creating institutions to develop these skills, maybe special courses or even specialized colleges. Look at the UAE, for example. They opened the world's first artificial intelligence college. Why can't India have one? You see, this engineering craze also did not drop from the sky. Parents saw the potential in it. Companies and governments needed engineers. Hence, engineering became India's thing. But now the market forces have moved on. The demand is for specialized skills, not degrees. So our colleges need to evolve. Luckily, money should not be a problem here. India's education industry is worth $117 billion. Indians are known to splurge on education. What they need is direction and awareness. Also, do not panic like it's the end of the world. Do not think that such changes are unprecedented or earth-shattering. Degrees going out of fashion is quite common. Just ask your friend 
with a Bachelor of Arts degree. Taiwan had a dramatic day, and that's putting it mildly. An earthquake struck and panic ensued. The quake measured 7.2 on the Richter scale, which means it was pretty strong. And the images look quite scary. Inside homes, plates and glasses went tumbling. Inside offices, every piece of furniture trembled. The worst hit was the city of Hualien. It was close to the epicenter of the earthquake. That's the point of origin, the epicenter. An entire multi-story building fell on a street here. This was Taiwan's most powerful earthquake in 25 years, and it shook places as far as Japan. Initially, Japanese authorities issued tsunami warnings. Later, this alert was withdrawn. In Taiwan, the quake struck during the morning rush hour, just before 8 a.m. local time, when many residents were just getting ready to go to work. You can imagine the chaos. It was a nightmare of a morning. Many people were trapped inside their homes. Some were buried under the rubble inside heavily damaged structures. We showed you the pictures from Hualin City, where a building collapsed. Across Taiwan, at least 26 buildings came crashing down, and the rescue effort was challenging. Emergency personnel found themselves in precarious situations inside tilted buildings, navigating dark corridors. <laughs> They moved from door to door, calling out the residents to identify and locate them. You see, 7.2 is a powerful earthquake. Anything above 7 is considered a major earthquake and causes serious damage. This one triggered nine landslides. Needless to say, the damage was considerable, but thankfully the toll was not so high. Taiwan has a population of almost 24 million. They've reported nine deaths from the earthquake so far, and nearly 900 people are hurt. Considering the severity of the quake, these numbers could have been much higher. So Taiwan has managed to protect its people from the worst-case scenario. But it's not letting its guard down. I have just heard the briefings from various units. I would like to ask each department to continue to pay close attention to the situation in various places, initiate various contingency efforts at any time and protect the safety of our countrymen. At this time, when there are frequent aftershocks, the government must ensure the accuracy of information and provide timely assistance to people in need so that people can feel safe and at ease. And that's exactly what happened. Through the day, Taiwan experienced aftershocks. As of this evening, they reported 58 tremors, one of them measuring 6.5 on the Richter scale. Despite all of this, the rescue efforts continue. Currently, the most important thing, the top priority, is to rescue people. Rescuing them is of utmost priority. We need to find out how many people are still trapped and to rescue them as soon as we can. Those injured should be given quality medical treatment so they can recover quickly. In some places, normal life has resumed, but till, till the afternoon, more than 87,000 homes were without power. Some roads, bridges and tunnels have also collapsed. The local authorities remain vigilant. Experts say they're expecting more aftershocks, some of which could be as powerful as today's quake. And Taiwan is particularly vulnerable. It sits on what is called the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's an area inside the Pacific Ocean. It is home to around 75% of the world's volcanoes. There are more than 40, 450 volcanoes in this region. And earthquakes are quite frequent here. Taiwan is also important for the, for the global economy. It is the biggest supplier of chips in the world. If this supply is disrupted, a range of industries will be impacted, from electronics to cars and telecom.
Trillions of dollars are at stake. If Taiwan's factories go offline, economic activity worth $2 trillion would be at risk. Thankfully, it has not come to that yet. But when the earthquake hit, operations at Taiwan's chip factories were disrupted. TSMC is the biggest maker of chips in the world. It evacuated workers from its chip factories. But later, the staff returned and resumed their duties. And we hope it stays that way. The next few days will be critical for Taiwan. Let's turn to Europe now, where NATO is celebrating its birthday. Quite an important one, too. Thursday marks the 75th anniversary of NATO's foundation. So the foreign ministers have gathered in advance. And their big mission? A long-term plan for Ukraine. NATO is looking to raise $100 billion for Kiev. This money will be spread across five years. But why now? It's been more than two years since the war started. So why is NATO proposing this now? Listen to what the alliance chief said. We are now discussing uh, ways to institutionalize more of the support within a NATO framework uh, to make it more predictable, uh, to make it uh, uh, more uh, um, um, robust, uh, because we strongly believe that um, support to Ukraine should be less dependent on short-term voluntary uh, uh, offers and more dependent on uh, long-term NATO commitments. Let me repeat that. NATO wants to be, to, wants the aid rather to be predictable. And it's clear why. Joe Biden had promised some $60 billion in aid, but the U.S. Congress has refused to pass it. And then you have Donald Trump. If he wins the White House, all bets are off because Trump has hinted at cutting off military aid to Ukraine. So what does NATO do? Create a long-term funding plan. Diplomats are calling it Trump proof. But how will such a plan work? Right now, NATO is not giving lethal aid to Ukraine. As an alliance, it is only giving non-lethal aid. All the military stuff is being given at the bilateral level. Member countries are giving arms to Ukraine, not NATO per se. The plan is to change that. NATO wants to take over the Ramstein Group. It's a coalition created to channel weapons to Ukraine. Currently, the U.S. leads this group, which means a future U.S. president could handicap it. So NATO wants to take over. It wants to lead the lethal weapon supply to Kiev, which again raises two questions. One, where will this money come from? And two, will all NATO members agree to this plan? Now, diplomats say all 32 alliance members will contribute money. How much is not clear yet. NATO already has a formula for sharing its budget. Maybe they will apply the same to this. If so, the U.S. could end up giving $16 billion. And question number two, will all the members agree? Looks tough at the moment. The likes of Hungary are not keen on this move. They say if NATO gives military aid, it will bring them closer to war. Others like Germany are on board. It is essential for us to turn the structures that we created on an ad hoc basis back then, for example, education, training and planning, into truly structured, reliable, long-term structures. The talks will be tough, but NATO is hoping to get this done by July. That's when NATO leaders will meet in Washington. But forget military aid for a moment. After all, it's a very divisive topic. Instead, let's look at NATO's economic warfare. Why has that failed? Because Europe is still buying Russian energy and a lot of it. Before the war, Europe bought piped gas from Russia. It made up almost 37% of the EU's supply. But after the war, that supply fell from 37% to just 8.7%. And it was good news for Europe. They wanted to reduce reliance on Russian gas. But lately, the trend is changing. More Russian gas is now reaching Europe. Moscow's share has gone up from 8.7% to 15%. How did that happen? Because of LNG, liquefied natural gas, around 10% of piped gas has been replaced by LNG. And why is no one complaining about this? Because it's a shady trade. You see, Russia exports LNG to many countries, countries like China and Japan. But some of these shipments are rejected. And that's what happened in Argentina. A Russian LNG shipment reached Argentina last year. 
but the importer rejected it. Argentina rejected it apparently because of some trouble with payments. So the ships, the shipments were rerouted to another country. Guess where? Spain. In fact, Spain is the biggest importer of Russian LNG in Europe. They buy some 5.2 billion cubic meters. Does this not violate sanctions? Well, technically, no, it does not. The EU has only sanctioned Russian oil. You can still buy Russian gas. Plus, most of these purchases are rerouted supplies, which means there is no Russian tag. You see, deliveries only mention the last destination. They do not mention the origin. So that shipment from Argentina would not have a Russian tag. It would have only mentioned Argentina. The gas came from Argentina then. And this is a technicality slash hypocrisy. Europe is buying Russian gas through the back door. And they're spending billions of it. $30 billion to be precise. Three zero, $30 billion of Russian gas. But there is no criticism. That's only safe for countries like India. All the European lectures to India for buying Russian oil when they themselves keep buying Russian gas. Typical European hypocrisy. It also tell you, tells you why this war keeps dragging on. Because the West is effectively funding both sides. There's a crisis in Pakistan, and I know what you're thinking. What's new about that? How is this news? Well, this crisis is different from the others. It is pitting the judiciary against the army. And it all began with a letter. Six judges of the Islamabad High Court wrote to Pakistan's chief justice. And what did they say? that Pakistan's spy agency was meddling in judicial affairs. We're talking about the ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence. And listen to the details. The judges say their relatives have been kidnapped and tortured, their bedrooms bugged, and their houses surveilled. The letter details seven specific instances. In one case, ISI operatives pressured a judge through relatives. He was eventually hospitalized due to high blood pressure. In another, another case, a judge's brother-in-law was abducted. He was later given electric shocks. But why did the ISI do all of this? They already have so much power in Pakistan. So why harass judges? To get favorable verdicts, especially against Imran Khan. The army wanted to keep him out of the elections this year. They wanted to get him disqualified. So some 150 cases have been filed against Imran Khan. Just one problem, though. The courts did not always play along. Let me take you back to August 2023. Imran Khan had been convicted in the Tosha Khana case. He was found guilty of siphoning off state gifts. But the Islamabad High Court helped him. They suspended the three-year jail sentence. They also ordered his release. Of course, the army just arrested him in a different case. So in the end, it did not matter. He remained in jail. But the court has not given up. This week, the same Islamabad High Court suspended another sentence, this time in a different Tosha Khana case. They decided to reverse Imran Khan's 14-year jail term. So let's connect the dots here. Imran Khan's team keeps appealing at the Islamabad High Court. The judges keep giving him relief, so the same judges get harassed by the ISI. And none of it is unbelievable. It sounds pretty much on point for the Pakistan army. The question is, what happens next? These six judges want guidance. They're asking, how should we respond to such intimidation? And to answer that, a meeting was called. Pakistan's chief justice met Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif. They decided to form a one-man committee, basically to investigate these allegations. A former chief justice was named for the job. His name is Hussein Jilani. Again, just one problem. Jilani said, I won't do it. He decided to recuse himself from the committee. Now, you may ask, why would he do that? Why wouldn't he help his fellow judges? And the answer is, this is Pakistan. If you investigate honestly, the army will target you. If you do not investigate honestly, you will be complicit. So either way, you lose. And looks like the army is already on the job. On Tuesday, eight judges of the Islamabad High Court got threatening letters. The envelope was filled with a suspicious substance. Today, it was the Lahore High Court's turn. Three judges there got letters with a suspicious substance. If this is not intimidation, I wonder what is. 
Imran Khan's party wants the Supreme Court to hear the matter. Hundreds of lawyers are demanding the same, but so far the Chief Justice has not done so. Now, lawyers in Pakistan can be quite powerful. In 2007, they led a movement against dictator Parvez Musharraf. It eventually led to his ouster. So could there be a repeat this time? As of now, it looks unlikely. But that's no excuse to ignore this issue. Where is the global outrage against the army's meddling? Why isn't the US urging transparency or fairness? They have no issues commenting on judicial matters in other countries, including in India. But on Pakistan, they're silent. It tells you everything you need to know about them. Our next story is from Turkey, where Recep Tayyip Erdogan is back to his old tricks. Turkey held local elections recently and President Erdogan's party was soundly defeated. It was a major blow. It should have led to introspection. Instead, Erdogan is choosing to double down. Like all one-trick ponies, he's choosing to do what he always does. Rob the opposition of their victory, starting with the city of Van. It's in the southeast of the country. The winner of the mayoral election here was disqualified. He has just been reinstated, but why was he removed in the first place? Well, Erdogan's party says he is a Kurdish separatist, that he has links with a terror group, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Now, this is not a new tactic. Erdogan did the same after the last local elections. He overturned multiple election results, but the people of Aan are having none of it. They came out in protest. Here's our report. We will open-heartedly analyze the results of the March 31st elections within our party and make our self-criticism boldly. However, we will not disrespect our nation's decision in any way. That was Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan on Monday, promising to introspect on his party's loss in Sunday's local elections and promising to respect the will of the people. Then, like most politicians, he immediately went back on his words and proceeded to try and steal the people's mandate, again. We are reclaiming our will and sending government-appointed trustees back. After midnight, we are taking our cities back. This was Diyar Bakir on Sunday night. The city is also known as Ahmed in Kurdish, after its ancient name, Amida. Kurds make up a majority of the city's population. The Kurds are a people without a nation, divided between Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria. They have been persecuted for years, especially in Turkey. But on Sunday, they were happy. Because, like in many other Kurd-majority cities in southeast Turkey, Erdogan's Justice and Development Party was trounced at the polls. The People's Equality and Democracy Party had won promising a new era of respect and representation for the Kurdish people. But that joy has turned to anger, all over Kurdish-majority cities in Turkey, because Erdogan is back to doing what he does best, disenfranchising the opposition. He has started with the city of Van. Van residents demonstrated their will in the elections. There is no other option but to comply and take this into consideration. This is a political coup. The People's Equality and Democracy Party won the mayorship with 55% of the vote, but their candidate has been disqualified because of alleged ties to the Kurdistan Workers' Party, a group designated as terrorists. The elections took place on Sunday. Turkey's Justice Ministry filed a complaint on Friday night, five minutes before the local electoral office closed. And now, with no chance to appeal, the winning candidate has been ousted. Instead, Erdogan's party candidate, who won just 27% of the vote, will become mayor. That is why the Kurdish people are angry. That is why they are protesting. And they fear that this is just the beginning. Other challenges are on their way. Another mayoral election in a city in the Isamli Urfa district is also being challenged. Again, the People's Equality and Democracy Party won. But Erdogan's party is contesting the win. It's a repeat of what happened after the 2019 local elections.
Back then, at least 52 opposition mayors were stripped of their offices and replaced by government-appointed trustees. The opposition fears that this will happen again. And that is why most of the major opposition parties are coming together to fight this. The biggest winner of Sunday's election, the Republican People's Party, has come out in support of the Kurds. Look, they first invested in the state-appointed trustee. Such a regime had not existed since the Republic was founded. Now they are disregarding the will of the people and trying to place another mayor here with another method in a completely lawless manner. They know that they aren't safe from the Erdogan regime's lawlessness either. They could be next. Ordinary Turkish people would do well to take note. Our next story is from Africa, from Botswana in the south. It's a moderately large landlocked nation and home to just about two and a half million people, which makes Botswana one of the most sparsely populated countries on earth. So what is happening with this relatively empty African nation? Well, it has decided to pick a fight with Germany. Botswana's president has threatened the Germans, not with a conventional war or anything like that, no. Botswana is threatening to send elephants to Germany, 20,000 of them. The message is, see how you like living with them. To understand this mammoth spat, we need to understand Botswana and its elephants. This country is home to about one third of the world's elephant population, about 130,000 of them, 1,30,000 elephants. Botswana is one of their last sanctuaries. African elephants used to roam across most of the continent at one point, but poaching and animal-human conflict have thinned their numbers. The situation is especially bad in poorer areas. For example, northern Cameroon. It once had thousands of elephants, but the last major survey counted only 148. Elephants are expected to go extinct there because poachers kill them for their valuable tusks, for ivory. But Botswana's elephants have avoided this fate. The country is one of the richest per capita in Africa. It has a thriving diamond export trade. And it is known for wildlife tourism. The income from tourism is second only to that from diamonds. And a lot of this money is reinvested in Botswana's nature reserves. It is used to defend against poachers and improve the lives of people that stay close to the reserves. Now, all of this sounds, so, sounds good so far. But there's also a problem. Botswana cannot handle all the elephants it has. There are too many to keep track of. They keep encroaching into human settlements. And incidents of human-animal conflict are on the rise. So what does Botswana do? It allows people to hunt the elephants. That's right. The world's best example of conservation is also an elephant hunting zone. Botswana allows rich foreigners to come to the country. They pay for a hunting license, pretend to be wild, intrepid explorers, slay an animal that did nothing wrong to them, and then take home a hunting trophy. You can imagine why rich, soft urban Europeans would enjoy this. A reenactment of colonial exploitation, recreating the imperial experience. It sounds disturbing, but Botswana says it is pragmatic. Europeans pay good money for these hunts, so Botswana humors the intrepid cosplayers, takes their money and uses it to fund conservation efforts. A side effect is that these hunts help cull the elephant population, helping reduce human-animal conflict. Morally speaking, it doesn't sound like a great solution, but if Botswana is taking care of the elephants, who are we to lecture them? Of course, the Europeans do not share this worldview. They love to preach morality and ethics, even when it's their own citizens who are paying for the hunts. Which brings us back to present day. Germany is planning to clamp down on the import of hunting trophies. Basically, animal bones and hide like from the hunted elephants. The German government believes that this will discourage trophy hunting. After all, if the cosplayers cannot show off, maybe they won't bother. Germany's intention is good, but it seems they haven't consulted Botswana. The president of Botswana is furious about this. The country has set up a delicate system, a way to pay for the conservation, but Germany unilaterally wants to do away with this. And they have the cheek to lecture Botswana while they're at it. 
which is why Botswana's president, Masisi, made a threat. He said he wants to give Germany a gift, a gift of 20,000 elephants, and he says he won't take no for an answer. Masisi said Germans should, and I'm quoting, live together with the animals in the way you're trying to tell us to. Imagine 20,000 elephants in Berlin lounging around the Brandenburg Gate and blocking traffic along the Autobahn. Maybe Germany and Europe in general deserve this, a reward for all their sermons, but that may be unfair to the elephants themselves. For the greater good, maybe they should remain in Botswana, and the next time Europe wants to do something, they should talk to the Africans instead of taking unilateral decisions and making mammoth mistakes. Our next story is from the Netherlands, the story of a 28-year-old woman called Zoraya Terbeek. She has chosen euthanasia, the act of dying with medical help. Of course, it's not new. So why is this case grabbing headlines? It's because Zoraya Terbeek has decided to end her life due to crippling mental health problems. She suffers from depression, autism, and borderline personality disorder. She has sought help for it all her life, she says, but now she thinks there is nothing more that can be done, so she has chosen legal euthanasia. Her choice has sparked a lot of debate. Critics say it would encourage more people to kill themselves legally. I must warn you, this story could be triggering, so viewer discretion is advised. Zoraya Terbeek. She's 28. She's physically healthy. She lives in a Dutch village with her boyfriend and two cats. From a distance, her life sounds blissful, but it's far from that. Terbeek has been dealing with mental health issues all her life. She grapples with crippling depression, autism and borderline personality disorder. She has sought help for her problems. She has tried many treatments, but nothing has worked. So Terbeek sees her mental illness as incurable, which is why she has now made a difficult choice. She has decided to be euthanized. Euthanasia is the practice of intentionally ending one's life. It is done by a doctor to limit a patient's suffering. Different countries have different euthanasia laws. In some countries like India, it's a crime, but in others, it's allowed. Currently, it's legal in around 10 nations. The Netherlands is one of them. In fact, it was the first country to legalize euthanasia in 2001, so patients can opt for it. The procedure will happen at her home. A doctor will first give her a sedative. Then she will be given a drug that will stop her heart. Her boyfriend will be by her side until the end. Following her death, Terbeek will be cremated. She has even planned for her ashes to be scattered in a designated location in a forest. The move reflects a growing trend in the Netherlands. More and more people want to end their suffering from mental health issues. They don't want to endure it, so they are choosing euthanasia. Terbeek's choice has sparked a lot of outrage. Some call it a worrying trend. They say euthanasia was long seen as the last resort. But increasingly, it's becoming a viable option for patients. They are giving up more easily and opting for it. Not every country allows euthanasia for mental illnesses, but countries like the Netherlands and Belgium do. Many believe this encourages suicide. Others also blame healthcare professionals. They say with the option of euthanasia, they are giving up on critical patients more easily than before. Take the Netherlands, for example. In the last decade, the number of euthanasia deaths has steadily risen in the country. In 2022, it accounted for 5% of all deaths. In 2022, it accounted for 5% of all deaths. So it's clearly no longer the last resort. While Terbeek says that her life was never going to get any better, the fear is that it enables and encourages more people to kill themselves legally. This week we've started the new financial year, so let's also talk about finances. It's often a stressful affair. For many of us, it can be intimidating. Come to think of it, schools taught us all about mitochondria, but so little about financial literacy. And it's a much needed life skill. 
Like riding a bike or making a cup of tea, all of us need financial literacy. We live in a volatile financial landscape. There's a slump in the global economy. Inflation is rising, so is our cost of living. The need of the hour is smart finance, like investments. But the numbers show an imbalance, a gender imbalance. Women are not as invested as men. On this show, we've often told you about the gender pay gap. Tonight, we want to dwell on the gender investment gap, and it's quite pronounced. One, only one in 10 women globally feel that they understand investment. Only one in 10. Only 28% are confident about it. 45% of, of them think that the stock market is risky. Take the UK, for example. A survey looked at men and women between the ages of 25 and 44. 34% of the men had invested their money, but when it came to women, only 19% had done it. Same for the United States. A YouGov survey talked to 1,000 adults. 62% men said investing was important. Only 55% women held the view. In India, it's no different. 33% women do not invest at all. 55% say they're unaware of their investments. So globally, women are hesitant to invest. And there are reasons for it. The first is the pay gap. We are in the 21st century, yet women still earn less than men. They have less money in hand, which means they do not have enough to invest. But what happens when they do have the money? What happens when they earn just as much as men? Do they invest then? The answer again is mostly no. Investing in the stock market needs two things, knowledge and confidence. That's what experts say. St studies say that women tend to lack both, or they think they do. So they steer away from stocks, plus they're risk averse. Stocks are a bet. You could lose money, and that puts off women. They tend to have lower financial risk tolerance than men. So they're more wary of investing. Instead, they put that money in a bank. In India, some women are wary of financial institutions altogether. Others don't even have access to them. So they end up holding on to the cash or turning to assets like gold. But here's the catch. The money you save does not bring you any return. Cash is good, but with time, it depreciates in value thanks to inflation, which means you are losing money by not investing. And there are few ways to change that. The first is by changing the attitude about investing. It may be complicated. It may sound complicated, but it's quite simple. Investment is a stable generator of wealth. There are two types of investments, short term and long term. In the short term, you invest some money, you reap the gains, you use it for purchases and emergencies, and it makes it a good fund to dip into. In the long term, many call it passive investment, you invest some money, you forget about it, over the years it grows, at the end of it, it could be a stable income for retirement. Take the stock market again, for example. It has an average return of 9%. That said, investing does come with its own set of risks. Assets can lose value over time, but you do have a lot of options. There's stocks, real estate, gold, bonds. Different investments have different risk levels. So do your research, figure out what works for you, consult a financial advisor. And if you're unsure, start out small. Invest small sums of money at first. Treat it as a learning experience. Gradually, you'll know more. You'll be more confident. And you will know what to invest in. Research shows that once women start investing, they do just as well as men. It's important for all of us to begin then, to take control of our finances, learn ways to make our money grow, because financial independence is central to empowerment. A lot of women remain trapped in bad situations because they don't have the money to break out. It's also important for schools to focus on this, make financial literacy a key part of the curriculum, encourage girls and boys to understand money. It gives you more security, more choices, and a better life. After money, let's talk about time. When it comes to time measurement, earthlings love abbreviations. We have GMT, meaning Greenwich Mean Time, IST, Indian Standard Time. There are plenty of others. And now there will be one more, LTC, Coordinated Lunar Time. The White House has asked NASA to figure out how to tell time on the moon. You see, time works differently there. It moves faster than on Earth. If Earthlings plan to set up lunar bases, they need to perfectly synchronize time with the moon. But it won't be easy. Our next report tells you why. 
Time is like that teenage boy in school. He gets good grades, he's on the school band, so he's popular among girls. But he's almost too mysterious. The more you know, the more there is to find out. And figuring out time is a difficult task. So now it's been handed to NASA. The White House has sent NASA a memo. It wants the space agency to figure out how to tell time. Not on Earth, but on the moon. And this is most likely not a one-person job. So the government has asked NASA to work together with other agencies, both in the US and abroad. The goal is to set up what's being called the Coordinated Lunar Time, or LTC. This will be a moon-centric time reference system. Why do we need it? Simply put, the time zone on the moon is different from that on Earth. There's less gravity on the moon, so time moves quickly there, by 58.7 microseconds every day, compared to that on Earth. That doesn't sound like much, but it has grave consequences. Imagine if people weren't syncing their clocks to the same time. It would be highly disruptive and challenging. The only upside would be that latecomers would have a legitimate excuse. But bad jokes aside, if we don't have a way to tell time on the moon, the same chaos would erupt. If and when spacecraft land on the moon, data transfers may be less secure. Communications between Earth, astronauts and lunar satellites will not be synchronized. There will be mapping errors as well. Locating positions on the moon or orbiting it will be tough. So there are plenty of reasons. Which is why we need a completely different frame of time for the moon. This will give Earthlings a timekeeping benchmark. It will provide the extreme precision required for lunar spacecraft and satellites on space missions. NASA has until the end of 2026 to complete the project and to set up the coordinated lunar time. Why is that? Because 2026 is a big year for NASA. It plans to send astronauts to the lunar surface two years from now. It's called the Artemis program and it's scheduled to begin in September 2026. The goal is to set up a scientific base on the moon and set the stage for future missions, especially the ones to Mars. But there's a challenge here as well. Time is measured by a global network of clocks. These aren't your average time tellers. They are atomic clocks, measuring changes in the state of atoms, placed in different locations to generate an average. That's how it works on Earth. And that's how it'll work on the Moon. Developing this coordinated lunar time will require many atomic clocks to be placed on the Moon. It'll also require international agreements, which will be a tough ask, especially for America because it would mean convincing its two main rivals in space, China and Russia. But the White House is determined to shoot for the moon. After the moon, let's talk about a star, specifically a Scottish pop star, 75-year-old Lulu. Her career has witnessed a string of hit records, but her biggest success was arguably in 1965 when she covered a song named Shout. Ironically, today Lulu is making news for doing the opposite. Forget shouting, she won't even whisper. Lulu claims she, she exists in a state of extended silence before her performances. In other words, she practices a speech fast, where she maintains total silence. And this has got people talking. Many are surprised. A speech fast is not just an extrovert's nightmare or an unconventional challenge. It seems near impossible because humans lead noisy lives. We are bombarded with all kinds of sounds. Beeping and buzzing phones, clickety-clack of keyboards or the sound of YouTube videos being watched without earphones in public places. Additionally, humans have a special talent. They can perpetually fill the air with sounds, with humming, screaming, laughter, and most of all, talking. So much talking. Studies say humans utter an average of 20,000 words per day. Now, don't get us wrong. This is not all bad. People need to talk. Phones need to be answered. Siblings need to squabble so they can later share relatable memes about that fight. We get that. But silence, too, is a human need. Studies indicate that constant noise boosts, boosts stress hormones. 
It increases blood pressure, raises the risk of chronic illnesses, makes us restless and distracted. A constant din also makes it difficult to process emotions. Yet, quiet is elusive in our world, which is why silence has become a luxury. People are paying exorbitant sums of money and going on meditative retreats. Some are spending time in anechoic chambers. These are soundproof rooms. And where there is a will, there is a wellness trend. Like the silent breakfast, uh, breakfast, where people silently eat their food and refuse to talk. Now, all of this may sound batty because you don't really need an exotic location or a silence chamber to do a speech fast. All you need is genuine commitment to slow down, to block out the noise, both yours and that of the world's. And you won't be alone in doing so. After all, structured silence has been practiced for thousands of years. In Hindu philosophy, Maun is the practice of silence. Ancient texts repeatedly mention it. Like the Bhagavad Gita, it teaches that, that silencing the voice helps us acknowledge our true nature. This talk of the Maun Vrat. Meanwhile, Buddhism has the practice of Vipassana. This is a period of silent contemplation. In Christianity, some orders of monks take vows of silence, but silence is not just a religious practice. Sometimes people use it to speak a thousand words. A speech fast can also be a form of protest. It can even be a somber pledge. But the purpose need not be sad, contemplative or religious. One can hold a speech fast simply because it is good for us. It has a multitude of benefits. It makes us better listeners. It increases empathy. It lowers blood pressure. It reduces stress, promotes brain growth, and boosts activity and creativity. So there are clear benefits here, but they come at a price. A speech fast brings you face to face with yourself, which can be challenging. It requires time and disconnect, which many don't have the privilege of offering. And it is downright uncomfortable. Speech is one of the primary features that separates human beings from animals. So a speech fast is not for everyone. But silence is. So steal some moments of peace, embrace the quiet power of silence. And if you are daring enough, after feasting on words, try a fast of words. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story in Germany. Visitors flock to visit a lake that has turned deep purple due to bacteria. One of the oldest books in existence is heading to auction. It was written in Egypt at the dawn of Christianity. And in Thailand, authorities unveil monkey master plan after they wreak havoc on, in, in, in a key central town. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1984. Rakesh Sharma became the first Indian in space. He was part of the Soviet Soyuz mission. He stayed on the Soviet space station for seven days and 21 hours. Till date, Rakesh Sharma is India's only astronaut. Leaving you on that note, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.